All right. Here we are. Good luck. Now, uh, move one, there is this little hash mark in the lower right corner. You could use this to resize the board. Nobody knows this unless you're like a LeechS developer, or if you've used LeechS before and seen the feature there. Yep. It's a hidden feature. Uh, so another thing that's new on the site is that numbers are appearing both on the ranks and the columns. Um, something about my brain is breaking trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, right, so I'm playing as Gota. So the lower left corner actually is 1-1. One, one. On 81 Dojo, when they number the ranks and files, I believe they either do so with the left hand and bottom, or the left margin and bottom margin, or the top margin and the right margin. Because of the way that Japanese writing style is done, I assume, I don't know, but I assume, like, if I flip the board, you would count the uh, ranks 1 to 9 down the edge, because this is the way they would write down the right file and then they'd go over to the next file down and this is how they would like write in a journal is one column at a time i think i'm not an expert don't quote me but that's what i think and why i think like the notation is traditionally to the right or above the board um anyway yeah, Static Rook. You don't see me playing that every day, right? But apparently, if you're going to play the Duck Legs Castle, this is the way to do it. So, um, I believe we saw a second ago that our opponent in this simul, Shogi Explained, has taken on about 10 opponents, and I believe he's explaining some of the games Unfortunately, there's not a great way for me to, like, see a mini board showing, like, here's the board he's on looking at and commenting on or something like that. That'd be cool if, like, somehow I could see that in the margin. Like, here's the board he's looking at. But, um, as is, we're just going to make do. Uh, okay, the file descriptors notation do show up below the board. That's good to see. Oh, right, I can draw arrows on the site. So, yeah, you do this, you do this, you pull up the silvers and pull out the golds. And then, unlike what I did this morning, where I basically allowed Shogi Harbor just to go straight down the eighth file and place a piece on 8-9, or 8-1, and ruin my castle... Um, evidently, like, what I should do is be protecting these squares that are particularly sensitive on the 8th file, so I don't get overrun on my own back rank. I had a feeling that that was appropriate, but I wanted to see, like, if there were a way to punish, um, behavior if the opponent decides to play very aggressively. Um, when will we have... Shogi War style pop-up graphics, you know, yeah, put it in the issue tracker and then learn Scala and contribute it. Nobody's working on it. <laughs> that is almost certainly an accurate assessment. Given that I'd started on a similar project about six months ago and got nowhere, um, that's Probably an accurate assessment to say nobody's working on it. Um, oh, you believe I'm working on the background music, the graphic, and voice narration for the Duck Castle. Sure. Yeah, let's go with that. Yep. Working nonstop, round the clock, to produce the best possible duck. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I wish we could take that duck from Delta Rune. And feature it here. If you haven't played Deltarune, sometime you do need to play it. Um, 
It's a good game. All right, so do I stick to the plan? Like, this is a weird move. Um, I advance the pawn in front of my rook again. I could see whether he's going to move his bishop or move the silver. Let's free up some space in front of my rook, shall we? But yeah, generally, next up is this. And this targets the square. Um... <laughs> Oh, it's not a weird move. It's the move order for Yagra. Like I said, totally a weird move. What realistic shogi player would ever play such a thing? I'm going to double down on my assertion. Cause, no, okay. Yeah, you're right. Fine. All right. I thought this is the year where we double down on every sort of statement we make. Because, you know... Apparently that's a way of showing strength or confidence. Also, uh, the clock here shows 01, 16. Perhaps this leading 0, 0 might not need to be there. I'm trying to think of circumstances where this clock actually shows over 9 hours. Given that... Even if you were to add time to the opponent's clock, I think it only goes up to six, something like that, hours. I'm not sure that there is a need for this to support more than nine hours and 59 minutes. Now, Correspondence uses a different clock, so maybe there it would be appropriate. Um. Oh, yeah. See, this is the Gangi thing snow roof um yeah see even when i'm wrong i'm still right all right uh but yeah yagura is just a really weird opening and what realistic player would ever play that right uh so um, yeah, one of the things that seems to crop up a bit in this, after this bishop comes out, sometimes there's some tricks that take place on this first file. And I don't really understand these tricks and tactics, but sometimes you can do some crazy sacrifices to open up, uh, the opponent's king's position. Um, now... A pro player is never going to let you just, like, crush them right in the opening. But it's interesting to try. Um, I'm actually curious. Uh, so th I say that because I did try the same opening against uh, Shogi Harbor this morning. And uh, my attack went almost nowhere. Despite the fact that uh, she momentarily forgot that she was playing Ibisha and then switched to Faribisha or something. Like, she had played some combination of static rook and swinging rook moves, and I still don't understand that. Um, but, yeah. Somehow, uh, that confusion occurred, but still my attack got basically nowhere. Um... And by the time I had started to build an attack, I was facing a checkmate myself. So, that was exciting. Um, yeah, how do I vamp for 73 minutes while I wait for my opponent to move? I don't know. Yeah, like, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> um... Oh, can you imagine? Somebody's got to go into the opening position thing. There's a database inside the code base. Or rather, there's a set of keys, a set of names, and a set of moves or starting positions. 
Somebody's got to add Duck Castle to the list of starting positions. But, I mean, what do you put as the opponent's formation? That's the tricky part. Maybe the whole concept of that opening selector might need to be reworked. Just so you could say, I'm going to select this castle or this opening strategy for one player, and this castle there's this opening strategy for the other player. I'm not sure how well it would work. Okay, so the opponent, uh, Shogi explained, has uh, committed uh, trying to deselect. One way you can remove all your arrows, highlights, and such is to click the opponent's king, because you're never going to have a move to take the king. And you can never move the king. They're a king. Um, so yeah, the opponent has committed to using the bishop to defend the square. After having spent a turn moving the... Now, we happen to know this formation is still called Yagra. And, like, you just move this here, move this here, tuck the king in, etc. This is rapid Yagra. Alright, so we know this. At least you know this. I don't. Um... I've never really played against this, because nobody on 81 Dojo plays this. So, um, anyway, we're going to stick with the strategy. And if Yagra happens to be the answer to how do you defeat Duck Castle, uh, we'll be happy. Also, the longer I wait to make my move, the more boards he has to go to before he gets to my board. I'm not doing that on purpose, but I'm trying to explain my moves. Whereas a lot of players see a move and they just, there's their reply. This is how simuls have been going lately. Um, and I'm not sure if everything switched to Biyomi, how that would change. It probably would not. Although, um, if we were using Byoyomi clocks, it would actually behoove players to take their time and not be afraid of getting into a Byoyomi thing. This is not Yagra anymore. Yagra would be Silver 7-7. Seven, seven. Oh, you can't do Yagra with the bishop there? I mean, I guess I've normally seen the Silver go there and the bishop go to 7-9. Like, normally, when I see Yagura, it's this shape, and then the bishop comes out this way somehow. Um, uh, so you're saying this is not considered Yagura anymore. Okay. I can believe that. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, Ahirman, um, he's played a lot of games where the rook has ended up just sniping this um i just thought my opponent was still playing yagra so i didn't even bother but no you're right this is exactly what uh the youtuber would do um he just snipes that every single time now i don't know if i could actually get that pawn because if i move my rook up two squares they're just going to push that pawn forward so i don't know that like my rook is actually the right piece to pursue that. In a lot of other positions, it would make sense. Here, I don't know if it's possible. I guess if this moved forward, maybe I push this pawn, they pawn advance. Yeah, I'm still not sure how my rook chases this. Um. Oh. All right, so we're looking either at snow roof or even a possibility of a delayed fourth file rook. Um, can't say I understand anything about that, because what we're looking at here um, is me attacking that center pawn. So for them to balance that out, this has kind of got to stay here. Um, so I'm not sure how the rook would get to the fourth file in this circumstance, although in other opening patterns, sure, you could say that this might be delayed fourth file rook. Here, I don't think that's possible. So I guess I'm forcing him to play snow roof, which I think he's played before. Um, if he hasn't played it before, this will be interesting. 
Uh, wait. Fourth file, third file, or even opposing rook. I wonder if I'm being trolled here, because I don't see how the silver can move. Like, they'd have to move a gold in front of the king in order to be able to move the silver in the first place. And if they're moving a gold in front of the king, that's yet one more move when they have not started to build the castle. Unless they can, like, build one of these snow roof or something like that. Um... Pawn 6-6. Six, six. All right, so you're saying let's push this. And then silver 6... Let's see, the problem here with pushing the silver is that that silver has a responsibility. He needs to, like, put another gold in front. Or he needs to, like, move the rook to defend this or something. Like, I'm not sure that they have time to get involved in building something so extravagant against um, this weird opening that I'm playing. And if they do put a gold in front of their king, the rook's not going to jump over the gold. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I just know you stick the bishop there, and then sometimes it participates in attack on the first file. And we'll see what that means. Like, the knight can hop out to the first file and stack itself on 1-7. And you just keep sacking stuff on the first file until you break through. Um, this happens. So, I don't really know what that means for my opponent's situation in this game. But the only reason I've even watched any of this, uh, Ahira man, other than him being tremendously entertaining, is just out of concern. All right, so we've got a choice. Uh, option A, option B. Um, so if A, they might push this pawn and further weaken their... Actually, I could retort by pushing my own pawn here and might be okay. No, I'm asking for trouble if this bishop can come out here. That could be dangerous. So let's continue with the strategy. Just play a patient move. And not put my rook in the line of fire just yet. Not until I've had time to bring my silvers out, or at least this silver forward. Once this is moved out, um, we can consider trying to snipe the pawn. But before that, it looks super perilous. Oh, well, this is great. <laughs> Wait, are you saying that uh, Shogi Explained is having some fun here, too? Nice. Yeah, he gets really excited when he wins. Yeah, that's that's for sure. He being the guy who plays uh, Duck Castle all the time. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's so, like... We led into the simul saying, ah, this is so unfair. And I'm like, no. I mean, yes, it is. But on the other hand, we're going to make an interesting game of it. So, um, yeah, I think he's right that, like, if I were playing uh, my normal stuff, this might not be the most interesting contest. But this is going to be good fun. Uh. I only make fun because, uh, or I make light of his comment, because, yeah, we are in the same rating class, and he's playing nine other games or something, so, yeah, it's not the brightest idea for him to accept me into this simul. But, on the other hand, I could play the duck opening, uh, the duck leg castle, and we could see where we end up. So, could still be a fun game. Uh, let's see if I missed anything. Uh, 
Uh, oh, yeah. Woogles has released a new update to their Chris Ra Cross Words site. I'm trying to remember. It has something to do with spectation being um, improved. So if you're following or if you're watching a game and the players do a rematch, you automatically get directed to their rematch game. So you get to watch all the uh, games that a player and their opponent play in a series, which is kind of cool. But if you'd started a game analysis, it'll keep you on the analysis so you can look at that in more detail. You can always go back and forth through the game list, too. Um, so that's a nice addition on Woogles. W-O-O-G-L-E-S. Um, oh, yeah, today uh, Lee Chess had hosted a tournament called the Bundesliga. It's predominantly a European thing. Uh, a lot of really strong players. I got paired with an international master. And I was playing in Zen mode, so I didn't know my opponent's ratings. I played some trash opening. Um, managed to confuse both of us. And then uh, my opponent had just outright hung a bishop. And to me, it looked like it was defended. Um, like, I did consider capturing it, and then I thought, well, no, if I take that, I lose my queen. So, after the game, like, I had the sense that, you know, I must have missed something this game. Something did not feel right. I wonder what I missed. And so, uh, I ran the automated game analysis tool, and it pointed out, hey... You probably should have just taken this bishop that your opponent clearly offered up. I'm like, wait, but if I take that, I lose... Oh, it's not defended. My international master opponent accidentally hung a piece. Perhaps due to a mouse slip or something, or just maybe we both had the same brain fart. But it was pretty incredible. All right, so... All right, um... Uh, option A, option B. So we see here, oh, this will show clearer if I do it green than red, given the color of the board. So A and B, wait, how do I do other arrow colors? Um, there we go, A and B. Uh, depending what target I want to hit. I am thinking B because my audience recommended it, and because A looks like he's actually defended against my threat. Um, and B looks more interesting anyway because it invites this possibility of him striking my rook and then I have to move it away. Uh, I just need to be super careful that if he pushes this, that I don't subject my rook to a pin. And then I have to play the silver first, and then I could push this pawn, and we could have some fun. Also, maybe I could push my edge pawn, I don't know, sometime. Uh, but if I play the rook, they play the bishop immediately. I move the rook over, and then they do something to defend this. That's not so bright on my part, is it? Um, yeah, I think I do need to play the silver first, actually. Uh, just to avoid tactic. Well, there's one other. There is a third option, believe it or not. How do I do other arrow colors? Yeah, there we go. Ah, the true uh, duck leg opening move. Taking the king out of harm's way. In this case, because we know the opponent's rook is not going to the center file, this king advance could actually be a really good move. Um, I can't resist, can I? Uh, you're right, no, it's not a pin if I move the rook up. It's just, like, wait, what? No, if I move the... If I move the rook and then they push this pawn, and then I stupidly push my pawn, then it's a pin. If I don't stupidly push my pawn in response to this pawn push, my rook's not going anywhere. 
So I want to be able to counter this pawn advance with something. Um, I could counter it with an edge pawn or either of these two moves. But also, if I play the rook out right now, they could play the bishop out. My rook needs a target. And I don't have an obvious target here. I think it makes the most sense for me to play my king up right now. And then figure out all the rest of the details later. Uh, yeah, but uh, I don't know, man. It's just... Yes, this bishop it becomes a target later. But um, I don't see this pawn advance um, here. I don't see this as weakening his position. It does create a hole, um, which eventually could be occupied in theory. But I don't see that as a weakness right now. Uh, oh. Uh, so it is. Yeah, you're right. So if he were to push the pawn in response to my rook advance, yeah, that would actually trap the bishop. Hmm. Yeah, shows me. So these are things I can also bear in mind um, if and when Killer Ducky plays this opening against me. If I choose to try to play Yagra against it, or whatever this ends up being. I think this is going to transpose to Snow Roof. So I blew it at this point. Um, so yeah, option A makes the most sense. Oops. Um, the target, well, so the problem with calling the target the bishop's head is if that pawn on the bishop's head has moved, there's no way to harass that pawn because I can't just move my rook uh, backwards like this to hit it. I mean, yes, in principle, in theory, the target would be the bishop's head, but this pawn actually does a very good job defending that if it happens to move up one. Now, I could just be talking on my butt because I don't know anything about this, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. I still think my king move is a decent use of a tempo. Um, but I am concerned. Even though my opponent has not activated their pieces yet, I am so concerned. So it'll still take me four moves to complete um, Duck Castle. Um, those being... We're still going to move the silver up, silver up, gold out, gold out to cover all of our bases. Um, uh, evidently, having participated in Shogi Harbor's uh, simul this morning, um, yeah, one thing to know about this is that although that dude on YouTube gets all these smashing attacks in the opening and makes it look super glorious, um, this opening commits four generals to fixed positions. So uh, what that means is that you have no generals to attack with. What that means, uh, according to Shogi Harbor, is... Uh, that it's not a rapid attack opening. It's a slow, challenging game. Um, oh yeah, also apparently exchanging rooks can be a good thing. Even though I couldn't figure that out this morning either. Yeah, so while 
at, on the one hand, I've been very excited this particular tourney to master round that I have got my pairing with Killer Ducky at last. I'm a bit just disappointed in the timing of this pairing that I've like had very, very little time to prepare. Uh, I, I really wanted an entire week just to study and look at all these crazy duck opening games. And I've not had anywhere near that amount of time to look at this stuff. So um, I'll just have to uh, play it by the seat of our pants. So uh, yeah, the simul game this morning and then this simul game are all the practice I really have time for. Then I'll have to coordinate my match time. So it's a bit... Yeah. Oh well, it is what it is. And the other thing is, I really don't want to hold back the tournament schedule just so I can spend all my time preparing. Because um, that feels like a shady thing to do. Alright, I'm confused. Look at this. You see, here's the timer, here's the other timer. I assumed that this timer would resize, or this timer would resize, so that they'd be the same dimension when they both have the same number of digits. Um, I guess that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, so if I like hit F5 here... Uh, and then I hit the, yes, I really want to refresh button. There you go. Um, but yeah, that's pretty weird. And I bet that Lee Chess also has that behavior. And the only way you would know that is if you started a game where one player had more time than the other, and that you would call a simul, and that the difference in time results in a difference in the number of displayed digits on the clock. Or, if you were a spectator watching a game, again, with the different number of digits displayed per player. Um, yeah, so that's probably a bug on Lee Chess as well as on Lee Shogi. Probably on Lee Drafts as well. So... I don't have time to fix that, because I don't really care. Because uh, the fix is just hit the refresh key. Or, just don't do that. Just give players the same amount of time. But anyway, uh, somebody will care more than I do. Somebody will probably report and, and or fix that. Um, or maybe sometime in the future I will care enough to actually record that issue. Um, but in the interim, I'm mostly focused on trying to get the Byoyomi clock working. Which, that's the other thing that's consuming my time and preventing me from studying. So, oh well. It's worth it. Um, I mean, if I end up losing... Uh, I mean, I did win my first tourney to master game. Because my opponent played an illegal move. Um, and he pointed out to me after the fact that had he played a different move, yes, of course, he's very, very, very much better, almost certainly winning, um, but uh, 81 Dojo's rules are what they are, and as much as I want to seed the point, uh, just... I'm not going to dispute the 81 Dojo rule set at this time, so I'm actually going to benefit from that. So I'll get my one win, which happened in run, round one. And then round two, I played a two Don and got smashed. Um, this round, I'm going to play Killer Ducky. Um, and if either of us ends up playing this opening, I'm probably going to get smashed, but it'll be an interesting game. Uh, and then I see that there are some players who were one Don who are uh, working their way back up to one Don. I'll probably get paired with them next. 
And if I'm spending all of my time coding instead of studying, um, bear in mind, like other folks are doing good productive things, but they're like practicing Sume or other things on stream that benefit both themselves and the community. Uh, I'm just coding, which does like nothing to improve my ability. So, um, yeah, I'm probably just going to get smashed in almost every tourney to master game. But it's still better this way than had I chosen to play or opted or been able to play um, in tourney to Shodan. I think I could still maintain a Wandan performance level on the site overall, despite getting... Uh, kicked around by all of our Don level players. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, like, I'm trying to watch Ahiroman, but also, like, I have no attention span um, because of work and life and coding. So, like, I'll have it up and running, and he'll make funny remarks, and I'll be like, ah -ha, and I watch him make the fun shapes, and, but, um, realistically, yeah, if I'm watching it, that's one thing. If I just have it up in the background, and I'm not, like, trying to figure out everything, or if I just have no idea what's going on, I'm probably not going to improve too much. Uh, yeah, I probably need to play on, like, multiple shogi sites to actually improve. So if I were to continue, if I were to watch that and then try to apply some of that on Shogi Wars, that could be amusing because on Shogi Wars, people play the most interesting openings. And can it get more interesting than the duck? I don't know. Somebody's good. I I think I saw at one point somebody did play it against him. I forget. Like I said, I'm not really paying attention when I have it up. Oh, also, uh, yeah, I've been trying to read other books, too. Um, uh, how do I explain this? Um... Recently, a book by Bill O'Reilly about the president came into my possession. And so um, I made it at least halfway through the book. Uh, revealed a bit about the background of our president and uh, his family. And uh, it really reinforces our common humanity at a time when... Um, uh, there's a lot of negativity, obviously, um, a lot of that comes from the president too, but, uh, whereas many presidents would seek to just rise above things and not get involved, um, that's not always necessarily the best strategy or something, I don't know depending on what your objective is. I have strong opinions, but I'm not sharing them. But yeah, this book came into my possession. I made it about halfway through the book. Didn't really tell me anything super special, other than like it reinforced like people are human, and um, they do things that interest those and the people they care about. So, even folks that, um, well, it cuts both ways. Folks that claim to be always doing things in your best interests aren't always doing such. And folks who are demonized in the public aren't necessarily evil. Um, they might not be good, they could be anti-heroes or worse, but... Evil is a really strong term, and it's thrown about pretty loosely. All right. We got the delayed... Well, no, I'm sorry. 
Uh, we were saying that we might get Snow Roof. This is not delayed fourth file rook at all, because there's two generals blocking the rook from getting to the fourth file. Um, so this is Snow Roof, which I don't remember. Um, but, okay, yeah, now they can actually easily defend um, this pawn on the bishop's head. It still weakens their shape to do it. Um, so perhaps I should force the issue. I just don't know. Yeah, okay, so this is Snow Roof. Um, hmm. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck do I do here? Because my opponent actually wants to put a general on the 6-7 square. And if they're doing that, then the pawn on the bishop's head is not a weakness. So I'm thinking I want to complete my castle. But like all my short-term attacking prospects are out the window. Um, this is... Kind of why I was saying I effed up, is by giving my opponent time to do all this. Um, so I'm not too happy about this. I could still try for an edge sack. So yeah, I could push this edge pawn, try to bring the bishop out and do crazy stuff, and bring the knight out. And Well, this doesn't even have to be done immediately, but this can still be done. Got to complete the duck castle first. Okay, so I'm not crazy. Um, Zug plays chess, of all things, on leechess.org. So that's going on, too. I just mentioned that because Zug, being a national master, uh, I don't know, deserves a better audience than often he gets. And he's a great teacher, too. He's not... Um, he won't give you the same opening advice that other masters would give. Um, he wouldn't give you the same endgame advice that I would give. Um, but he still got a decent, somehow, vision and ability to teach the game to players, um, at least up to a 2000 level. So, yeah, I still recommend people do watch uh, Zug Addict uh, play chess. He will point out a number of instructive things and explain them in uh, great detail. Whereas uh, some other masters might not go into the same level of detail explaining a concept. I think another player, another few players come to mind who are very pedagogical in their explanations. Um, one being a Fide master, Dennis Montecrucis, who has uh, run his own blog and video series and such for a long time, offered products on Chess Space, I believe. I'm not completely remembering it all. Uh, has also done products and videos on chess videos. Um, you see, yeah, Dennis Montecrucis is way, way up there. Um, I mean, yeah, people will say good things about John Bartholomew. I can't speak ill of him. Um, who else did I have in mind? I had two other players. Oh, Josh Friedel does explain things in great detail. Um, as does actually Sierra Juan. Goodness, how did I forget? Yeah, if you want somebody who can patiently, thoughtfully explain a concept and explain what's not the concept and explain to you why the concept is the concept and so forth, like, uh, Sierra Juan absolutely comes to mind. Um, I'm feeling terrible for forgetting the other names I had 
that I was going to mention. But yeah, online, it's rare to see a master go into detail explaining things the same way that CR1 or that Monocrucis or that Zug Addict do. So um, that was my main point, is that it's worthy of watching. Even if often... <laughs> The other thing that's incredible is just watching, like, so you've got this national master who has performed excellently at tournaments, who does very well studying and producing puzzles and studies and all sorts of interesting material, who has this tremendous knowledge and love of the game, and just momentarily sometimes will have the most epic brain fart. Um, and it's very unfortunate, but it's also curious to see, okay, like the same way you could watch a Tetris player try to dig themselves out of a tough situation, you could watch a chess player try to figure out, um, just how to recover from a hideous mess that they've accidentally put themselves into. Yeah, there's a lot. It's amazing. Um, ever since, well, two phenomena. One, the thing that is 2020. And two, um, just Lee Chess doing a tremendous job promoting, uh, or providing a platform, rather. Not promoting, but providing the platform that provides the best live streamer experience. Um it makes it really easy to get online. It makes it easy to produce a large board and feature that on a live stream. And you can even put a webcam in the corner or something. Um, Lee Chess makes that really accessible and makes that user experience great. Um, now, some people will like not put in the effort to like make the board large because they don't care. Uh, either they don't know or they don't care or they just haven't asked or haven't tried or they're just not familiar with technology. Um, so it's unfortunate you'll find a number of players out there who do live stream who just like they have a window inside of a window inside of a window and then they'll have some minuscule board hidden somewhere in there. And you'll see their face, their room, their dog, their everything. Fine, that's their free choice to do that sort of thing. Um, but no, Lee Chess provides a good platform. Uh, what Lee Chess is kind of lacking at the moment there is uh, cross-promotion opportunities. Since it's so accessible, there's really no rules or guidelines about how live streamers are supposed to cross promote each other so even though sometimes this does happen it could the community as a whole would benefit if uh, there were more cooperation between uh, them instead of thinking about it as competition um it's rough especially when if you are a live streamer and then you say you play video game music on a piano while you live stream and you meet another person who could play like classical music on their piano as they live stream you could even do events together uh you might feel threatened somehow not that you should but like people just fear the unknown so yeah you have that sort of phenomena where People are afraid, well, there's a better person out there. Why should I try to help them if they, I don't know if they're going to always help me back. And maybe there's some validity to that, but it's just sad. So yeah, there's a lot of competition in the way that's perceived. Um, whereas in like Shogi and Go and I think Woogles as well. There's not yet that same volume of live streamers yet. So there's just, hey, we're so glad that you're here. And please check out all these other people and these resources. And 
a lot of cross promotion going on I'm not really seeing it as competition at the moment okay we're slowly inching toward sacrifice city um didn't expect that to happen so soon <laughs> he's just solidified in his mind that we're playing duck oh good oh good he he knows this is good gotta play rook eight four here to defend my bishop yeah rook eight four was on my candidate move list candidate candidate um we're saying we have to do this oh right because like this is actually a thing Yes, you're absolutely right. I was also thinking about this because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but no, rook eight four makes sense. And I'm in a position where rook eight four no longer leads to all kinds of nasty or at least scary things. And it's not as if he's going to let me ever push pawn eight six. So let's play rook eight four. That makes sense. The bishop move is good once I complete my castle. Uh, rather, rather than good, the bishop move is interesting after completing my castle. Yeah, so the deal here is that if I start an attack prior to completing my castle, my king is a sitting duck in the center, quite literally. Um... So that's why you play the duck legs. So you bring the silvers up and the golds out to cover everything on the low side of the board. Um, that just becomes very difficult for the opponent to attack. Uh, good call on rook eight four, by the way. Normally I wouldn't like um, seize this kind of advice. I was considering bishop 2-4, uh, then I was like, well, he could push this pawn in front of the rook, and that's really inconvenient. But no, this is like the key idea. And while I have seen some sacrifices where you like throw away the bishop to break in on the first file, we're not there yet. Um, yes. Right. Yeah, so my bishop stands in the way of my lance. Um... So yeah, I probably would have just fallen directly into that, and we would have just ended the simul game right there. Not literally, but it would have been a moral defeat, and we would not have learned anything other than, hey, we need to play rook 8-4. Whereas now we learned, hey, we might need to do something. Well, and maybe given, I don't know, I had 18 minutes on my clock, could have spent maybe 15 of that trying to figure it out because um, I just had no idea. Maybe I could have figured out Rook 8 4. Would have taken time. It's looking good so far, you say. So the thing that always bothered me about this is I've never been optimistic about this castle because you're committing four generals you're saying my generals are just gonna my generals are just gonna sit here for the duration of the game and i'm gonna try to find a way to attack given only my knights and lances and rook and bishop i cannot use any of my generals to attack likewise i cannot be attacked um so it looks painful honestly uh so yeah <laughs> you start sacking pieces and just stuff them into the top left corner and try to promote them and stuff yeah i mean it is what it is this is the nature of the opening um i'm just concerned that once my opponent builds their castle like, I don't think this is the most stable castle either. I want to see it torpedoed. Or if it is stable, I'd like to know how. <laughs> Obviously, I missed, like, some pretty obvious tactics this morning. Um, 
just allowing a rook drop on my back rank. And I'm like, oh, does this matter? I have no idea. Turns out, allowing a rook drop followed by a bishop drop on your back rank can be kind of dangerous. Even if you're threatening to maybe eventually make a threat. You, in this case, being like, I had some extremely slow attacking ideas and just allowed a rook and a bishop to drop on my back rank and that was it. Um, yeah. Well, so yeah, that's the thing. So he's going to build some kind of castle. It'll either be in the upper right or the center or the upper left. It's going to be one of those places, and wherever that castle doesn't cover is going to be the weak point. I'm not even playing this to try to win it. I'm just playing this to see two things. One, can I learn this castle a bit better for both sides? And two, what kind of fun reactions can I get out of Shogi Explained by playing this? So we'll have to check that out in a bit. All right. So he has defended the head of the bishop. Also, I don't know if that's snow roof or not, but it's a shape. Uh, if I play the rook to the center file, they could just play the silver right in front. So it probably behooves me to continue just building the castle one silver at a time. Still snow roof? Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, let's just keep building the castle. So, I've seen a hero man play like silver, silver in some order, then gold and gold. And then he plays the king up. Um, we happen to have played the king up first because it seemed practical. Um, but yeah. He still could play these out. I've one time I saw him play this the golds up instead of to the side, which creates weaknesses on the back rank. And the reason we know it creates weaknesses is because Shogi Harbor <laughs> uh, put a pawn here. I took it, and like yeah, I opened up my back rank. So you don't want them up here. You'd rather have these golds off to the side. Yes. Spinal Tap, I am playing the old Duck Castle. This is my second game playing Duck Castle. My first was playing it against Shogi Harbor this morning. And you can guess who won that game. Um, yeah. Are you following Ahiro Man? <laughs> uh, yeah. And the more that I've tried to watch a Hero Man, the more I just get so puzzled, like, what the heck is going on? And I think sometimes, at least the moments that catch my attention the most, he seems puzzled too, as if he's also learning the game. Um, so as much as he's played this castle, like, a zillion times, uh, who knows how many variations on it there are. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, let me do that. How do I... Does that work? Yeah, there we go. Although I think check channel regulars uh, are permitted anyway. Um. But yeah, there's... oh. Yeah, perhaps I should. Uh, to do... Add com... Duck? Uh, Ahiro? I wonder. Yeah, I kind of like duck. Yeah. Actually, it's duck legs, so let's just call it Ahiru.
Yeah, so we got a command for Ahiru Man now. See? This is what I'm talking about. We're, we're not afraid to cross-promote. Like, I know there's zero chance he's going to bring any viewers to my channel ever. But still, he's a good resource, so I promote him. So, yeah. But uh, I should return back to my earlier point that um, it'd be fun to get the duck from uh, Delta Rune into um, the in game display for castles. If anybody ever does that, have you ever seen the duck from Delta Rune? If not, you've missed out. Uh... Got a comment in one of his videos. Uh, oh, has the English community representative. I think one time I did comment where something pretty extraordinary happened in the video. I'm trying to remember what, but you're right. If I comment more regularly, maybe he'll have some idea that there's some kind of English audience for his videos. Uh, partially thanks to him setting the video language. So since he sets the video language to Japanese, uh, Google can do its magic to attempt to transcribe the video, and about half of it comes out as parsable English. Something about flying cars and ministers and things like that. And you can kind of guess, like, when they're talking about a car, that's the rook. When they're talking about money, that's, like, the gold general. So, like... It's not great, but being able to combine that with the recognition of letters and numbers and such, or rather numbers, um, kind of makes it possible to watch these videos, especially if he's uh, indicating things with the cursor while he's talking. So, such is the state of translation. Uh, and that's something... You know, if I have time, I'd like to work on. But it's never going to happen. I'd like to, but... Um, actually, Tom Scott makes a good point that purchasing transcription, um, I guess in English, for an English video, uh, is about a dollar a minute for somebody to just take everything that you have said within the minute and type it down. I assume he's talking about just transcribing an English video. I don't know what the rate is for other languages by other providers, but... Uh, okay. So I want a Rook Exchange, and my opponent is very close to offering a Rook Exchange. So I am extremely confused. What... Why is he not castling? Is my position just that weak? I mean, I have to complete my castle here. A rook exchange is going to devastate me on the 8th file unless I move this gold out. So there's really not a decision to make here. But, um... Yeah, this surprises me that... Uh, he's this anxious to play a move that I haven't seen played against Ahir Man. So, yeah. You know, more likely he would send viewers to my videos. Although, my most popular videos have nothing to do with Shogi. Like, one time I did a speedrun of Super Solvers, Gizmos and Gadgets, Airplanes, or Aircraft. Um, apparently that one got quite a few people interested in science, which was really the goal. Um, some speedrunners complain, hey, this is not a speedrun, because even though you have a timer going, you suck. I'm like, okay. So, I mean, I did make a good attempt. I think I had a decent time. If I practiced, I probably could manage a better time 
Um, they're not wrong that I'm bad at gizmos and gadgets, despite having practiced many, many years ago. And despite having some very extremely limited repertoire strategies, um, some basic things about how do you navigate the map um, were not quite there. Anyway, um, my most popular videos do not have very much to do with Shogi at the moment, although I am producing quite a bit of content. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the Duck Leg Castle. Um, so I think it just means duck. Um, I don't know, like where the leg thing comes into play, although obviously, like, the shape here, you have the duck kind of floating in the middle and sticking its legs out to the side, but um, I think ahiru just means duck. But it's, I think, implied that it means duck legs. Well, the only reason I know that is because when I've heard people call it the Duck Castle, some people get indignant about it, and I don't remember who. But pretty sure there's something. Duck strategy? All right. Sounds good to me. I just remember there was, about a year ago, a game, the Untitled Goose Game. Uh... Like, where you get to be, have the full experience of being a goose. Just going around, taking things out of the gardener's yard. Um, biting things off of shelves. Uh, snatching items from people and from stores. And just otherwise being a nuisance. Uh, and making noise. Um, so, yeah. Um. Unfortunately, Untitled Goose Game was not about a duck, but I think we can agree that both geese and ducks, although geese are more evil than ducks, um, I think we can agree that they they both have some kind of free spirit that annoys the heck out of other living beings. Um, oh, yeah, no, I seem to remember um, there being some sort of multiplayer capability that was added more recently. I forget if that was online or offline multiplayer, uh, or land-based or whatever. Um, but no, that's actually quite funny. And I think in some cases a bit easier, because some of the challenges in the original game were difficult. With You have the gardener chasing you around, trying to undo all the things you're doing. Sometimes fighting with the gardener can be a difficult experience. So, it makes sense to make a multiplayer game. Well, I should probably draw some arrows or something so that he's going to move. Um... All right, I drew an arrow. Uh, hmm. <laughs> I do understand that my resources are supposed to be in the mainly in the form of attacking down the first file. I am a bit concerned because if my bishop tries to do that immediately, then this pawn just strikes my bishop. Then I can move it away, and then this pawn strikes the bishop and has to move away again. Something doesn't look quite right about that. Um, alternatively, I could push the first foul pawn. Pawn takes, move the bishop, pawn moves, and then sack the bishop for a pawn. Lance takes, lance takes, and God knows if I can manage to get anything attacking the rook before I get mated. Um, probably not. Right now my rook is behind my pawn. Pawn's not going anywhere. Maybe my rook belongs somewhere else. Um, but it needs to safeguard the square and 
that's the head of my bishop. So this is kind of a target. So now we've drawn an arrow, we've drawn a circle. Uh, Shogi Explained must be thinking about something. Probably not even this game. Um, yeah, he did volunteer to play quite a few games at once. Let's see, what other games are new? I do want uh, to make progress. Uh, well, yeah, Celeste is my next focus. Okay. Finally, a decision on where this piece might be going. Uh, again, it protects the center. Um, again, this helps build the snow roof shape. I don't see any tactic to smash that. So I should just continue castle building so I don't screw myself. And now duck castle or duck strategy is uh, in its first formation. We have constructed the duck. Now we have to figure out what to do with it, which is the hard part of the game. I could instead push my third file pawn name for Ishida, like for my... Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about, like, all of the pawns that I can push here. Um, so timing-wise, I have to be careful. Depends on what my opponent does. But I could seriously consider this. Ah. I think what Abigail is announcing is that I have uh, constructed the duck castle. Yes, right. That's what I was thinking. It's like, well, in theory, it sounds really nice for me to do that. In practice, it immediately seems to get my bishop in trouble. So I don't... Ahiru complete. All right, that makes sense. So yeah, I might need to move the bishop before I try to do that. Um, but if the bishop's gonna move, then I don't know how I managed to push the pawn. Like, unless the bishop actually retreats, which seems ill-advised. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, alternatively, perhaps somehow my rook can make it up one rank somewhere. Um, like, I could consider putting the rook on the third rank and then moving it, or the third file, moving it up a rank. And trying to start some tactics that way um, or if my opponent builds the snow roof by pushing the center pawn then maybe my rook can go to the fourth file instead and then up a rank um, yeah I don't know yep we're somehow just out of the opening. Uh, opponent is beginning, or has actually formed their castle at this point. And I don't have a clue. And it would be scummy if I had to rely on my viewership to come up with all my moves for me. So, candidates. One, uh, 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 two, um, three? That seems like a wasted move. 
Um, let's see. It's looking at four. I briefly considered moving the rook over one more file, but that does nothing. Uh, moving the bishop here just invites the opponent to use their knight. Um, putting the rook on the third file would not make it any easier to push the third file pawn. This is complicated, man. Add bishop to... F okay, yeah. Yeah, I gotta add that. As much as, like, pawn 2-5 looks like a counter, should at least be on the list. This is on the list, although that's, like, suicidal. So we're not going to do that. Um... <sighs> do, do, do. I'm so confused. We want to make... Okay, so yeah. Would like to make pawn 3-4 work. Wouldn't we all, but I'm pessimistic. So I spend a boatload of time here. It'll be forever until Shogi Explained gets back to this board. At which time he'll have forgotten everything he analyzed. Uh, yet another advantage to switching to Bioyomi instead of, um, anyway, uh, increment. Um, I, 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 like, what the heck? Rook to the center file is not terrible. Would allow me to do a fourth file or sixth file pawn advance. Uh, so yeah, this is a candidate. Well, it strongly encourages uh, either the silver to move. Well, then the silver is going to move again. Yeah, that's actually quite annoying. Uh, so yeah, let's take rook center file out of the list because the silver counter seems decent against it, even though that's not snow roof anymore. Um, If I could just get a pawn in hand, that would be great. Alright, we're going to play this impulsively because I am impatient. It's not even a great move. It blocks me from pushing my pawn, but tactically I don't think there's any way I could have made this pawn advance work. What this does open up is the possibility of me pushing the other third file pawn. Um, the seven file, so this might become a thing, and then we could aim again at the bishop's head. Um, it, this is highly unusual, but like he's doing everything in his power to prevent me from doing any kind of attack on this side of the board, and in so doing, is like I don't know. The other thing I'm thinking about is moving the center pawn, and then we could play this sort of thing. And God knows where we end up after all this. Like, either the bishop ends up dropping back when harassed, or the knight hops out and participates in a fight against this pawn. Um, it looks complicated. 
Oh, but if I push the center pawn, then the silver could come out and hit the rook. And the rook's got nowhere to go and gets sacrificed for a silver, which might be okay. Yeah, maybe bishop 2-4 is the more reasonable approach than anything here. I was just concerned that he pushes this, and then my bishop goes forward, and then he pushes this, then my bishop goes back, and then he pushes this. And, like, yes, he's forming holes, but I have not broken in. I've not made inroads. Um, whereas I think somehow I'm going to make this work. Even though this looks super improbable. I think with my bishop diving over here, I can actually hit the square and start to open something up. Which is really weird, but um, I really don't see what he does. Oh, okay, yes, I could... Oh. Yeah, I guess pawn 2-4. I was concerned about the possibility of, like, after I play pawn 2-4, how do exchanges happen? Um, I actually should not be afraid of a rook exchange. I should not be afraid of offering the rook exchange to pawn dropping in front of the rook, because then I'll have a pawn in hand. So in chess, the way that we think of forcing pawn exchanges is by supporting the pawns as they advance up the board and then forcing the exchange if we have to. Here, by making the rook and or bishop a target, we lure the opponent's pawn forward and then can exchange it on our turf. Um, whereas in chess, normally you wouldn't want to lure pawns forward because you just lose space that way. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I've constantly underestimate the value of having a pawn in hand. And I've been smashed so many times by a pawn on the 8th file, or on the 2nd file, or the 3rd file, or the 7th file, that, like, I'm always afraid of letting this pawn just run. And then often I end up putting a pawn down to stop the pawn, and it gets even worse. Um... But no, that's a good point. Pawn exchanges in Shogi are so complicated. And maybe part of the reason I'm playing it this way too, I don't know. Like, if somehow bishop 2-4 uh, did end up just being some sort of opening trick or idea that neither of us really understood, but it ended up working, it'd feel awful winning a simul game playing an idea that I didn't have any faith in. Um... Like, I have to have some belief in my move uh, if I want to win with it. Well, so again, I believe he took on about 10 or more than 10 opponents. Um, 
so he's feeling the time pressure, but also I'm spending time on my moves, which means I'm moving slower than most of his opponents, which means on this clock, he has more time than on other clocks. Um, so he's not going to get to this board in a very long time. And when he does end up looking at it again, he'll be like, oh, what was I doing last time I was here? I'll have to remember it all. Um, and while for an engine that might be an optimal strategy of sorts, just if engines have an infinite amount of memory and can just instantly reload uh, thoughts, um, yeah, a person might have difficulty playing uh, in a way that they just don't see a game for a while. So a person would maybe shuffle through the games differently than a machine would, if given a choice. But yeah, I can also add to this list of ideas. So beyond this, there's also just bishop 2 4 again, inviting the pawn advance. And yeah, I've squandered a single tempo here, and possibly worse than that. But um, I should have some possibility of opening the file and exchanging rooks, which is very important here. Um, so. This is not the worst place that I could have put my rook. That's not a smart move, but um, yeah, bishop 2-4 is still playable. I have not yet lost, although I did burn a whole tempo moving the rook over here. That probably didn't need to be burned. Um, I don't know what our opponent can do given that entire tempo. Maybe I'll just push the edge pawn or something. Try to expand their king's ability to run away from attacks. Although that could backfire too. You never know. Like, if they push the edge pawn, if I push my edge pawn, what are they doing next? If they push one of these other pawns, this does create some weakness. Like, I've got this covered. Uh, Hang on. I want to use green circles to indicate what I'm controlling. Um, putting a pawn over here just seems unwise because it leaves this hole behind here. So I don't think they want to leave this as a hole. Um, they're certainly not wanting to open this hole. Maybe they have interest in... Well, they don't want to push this pawn in front of their king either. It's like all the these pawns form their castle. None of this is moving. Uh, this one can't move because I control the square in front. This one I control the square in front. Um, we've already covered why they don't want to push on the second file, because then I just offer the pawn exchange and rook exchange and get the pawn in hand. And that's fine. Um, now, if they push this, maybe I also just push the edge file pawn and then push this or something. Just concede a pawn in order to get a more rapid attack going. That doesn't look right, but it's possible. Um, but yeah, if they push the edge, if I push the edge, then what? Uh, I control this square. So this marks one, two, three, four, five, six pawns that can't, seven pawns that can't move. Um, and if they push the edge and I push, that makes eight pawns that can't move, and one pawn they don't want to move. So, um, yeah, I'm a bit confused what they do with the tempo here. They could move the king again or something. But until they start moving pawns, uh, they really can't move anything. So that's kind of how I opted to play this rook move. Is by process of elimination, thinking like, well, I could give my opponent a tempo and they can't do anything constructive with that tempo right now. They could try to hunt down 
uh, my pawn on file eight. But uh, they'd be doing that with their knight. And if they do that with their knight, uh, their knight's not going to be on this board for much longer. So uh, that's possible. But other than that, I don't really see anything they can do other than just shuffle their generals around or maybe move their rook up a square. Rook up a square is not terrible, but it doesn't change anything. So, yeah, it's up to the opponent to find something. So I don't really need to regret my rook move, but it's just a tough situation. Yeah. Yeah, also I did want to start developing pieces on my right half of the board. Although, that uh, knight on uh, 8-1, it's a very useful defensive piece. Um, so my heavy pieces have the left half of the board covered. Uh, right now my knight is more useful as a defender than as an attacker. Um, but yeah, if there were a safe way to develop the knight, that'd be nice. Yes, no, I think that's more likely what's going to happen, unfortunately, is that uh, he just doesn't have time to focus on this game. And it was an interesting opening exercise for us, us, the whole community. Um, now I noticed... <laughs> This morning when I was playing a simul, uh, there was a draw button, and it was grayed out. Now as I'm playing, there's not even a draw button. You can't offer a draw. That's weird. I mean, fine, but... Um, that's so weird. I understand that, like, under tournament rules for Shogi... Like, you have to do repetition to actually get a draw. Um, but in the context of a simultaneous exhibition, there might be circumstances where an opponent has to go, or something else comes up, like the simul host gets in time pressure, and players might want to agree to a draw, despite normal tournament rules suggesting that this should not happen. Um, so, yeah, I don't know why the button's gone. That's kind of weird. Maybe just the button didn't work, so it was grayed out, and now it's been removed, and there's not a strong interest in re-adding it. That could be. But yeah, when I try to re-implement all these features uh, atop the latest uh, Lee Chess code base, and the reason I do that is because I think this project is just, like, it's being compiled without tests. That's not a good way to develop a project, because it puts the project in jeopardy of just not being able to keep up with... Um, security patches and browser version updates and other browser stuff. Um, you really do want to be compiling with working tests. But since so many changes were made with all the tests turned off, now it's difficult to turn the tests back on and then fix all the code to match up with the tests and vice versa. So that's kind of what I was thinking. I need to start over with coding this um, so that incrementally code changes can be made and tested. And while that'd be a huge, huge pain in the butt to do, and that's why I've been delaying working on this project at all and somebody else beat me to the punch, um, I think the project would be a lot better off for it um, 
if there were working tests, and I don't know any other way to get working tests than to start over. Anyway, um, yeah, it looks like he's not going to win on time in any of the games, and probably the opposite will happen in quite a few games, despite giving himself a one-hour lead at the beginning. So, I don't really know what to say. Um, I've been suggesting that Byoyomi would be something that makes sense, um, both for the simul host and for the players. But that really, I don't know whether or not that addresses this problem that if you think you're going to have a simul with five people and then 10 show up, or if you think you're going to have 10 and then 15 show up, you're going to have problems. Um, I don't know how best to manage that unless there's some way that you can scale like the Bioyomi or the increment based on the number of remaining opponents. So maybe the host gets more time per remaining opponent. Um, in terms of Bioyomi time or something. So, even that's prone to abuse in some way. Like, if the simul host is clearly winning a game but chooses not to give checkmate just so they can continue receiving more time, that's possible. Um, or if he, the simul host, had a shared clock and somehow. I don't know. Every game that he moved on did something to uh, increment a timer on all of his games. Um, that might be fair, too. Uh, the timer might have to count down faster. I don't know. There's probably some fair way to make it work that I just haven't thought of yet. But also... In the event that Shogi Explain does happen to make it back to my board, this is not an easy position to figure out. So if he is actually here, um, yeah, I don't know what he's going to do. Maybe move the king again. Moving the king again is something I might do. Well, no, it puts the king in the line of fire, which he deliberately avoided. He's been trying to avoid giving me any kind of tactic at all. And I've been missing tactics, like I could have done bishop 2-4 and threatened to do some tactics based on if that pawn advances to hit the bishop, it just moves away and I have tactics at my disposal there. Um, which may or may not work, but at least I have them. He's been trying to categorically deny me the ability to do any kind of tactic here, and it's been challenging. Um, so what that's led to is this position where he's had to restrict his own movements. Um, yeah, he's built snow roof um, and he's just got to stay put while I start attacking. Yeah, we'll take this second bishop move off of the um, display here. Because, yeah, bishop 2-4 is the move, and then they advance the pawn, and then all the tactics explode like fireworks. Um, there was an interesting point that was shown um, this afternoon, I think, by Shogi Explained. He's pointing out the shape of the squares differs here versus 81 dojo and he's right and it's kind of difficult to do much about that but you'd prefer to have a 12 by 11 proportion to the squares instead of a 12 by 12. Um, so this somehow is a bit more relaxing to a chess player to look at a board and it actually looks more or less like a chess board 
but um, yeah, that's not actually how shogi boards are shaped. And so when a player is trying to figure out what squares are on the diagonal for the bishop, it's super trippy Try just trying to figure that out. And while normally I would object, um, actually the more I look at it, the more normal this looks to me. Just because every time I'm looking at a shogi board, I have difficulty figuring out how the bishop attacks stuff. And I've tricked some opponents too, so it's like, yeah, the, the fact that the board is not square actually kind of does matter. But also, you can't really fit the elegant two kanji figures onto the pieces um, unless uh, they're the right shape. So for the pieces to be the right shape, you kind of need the 12 by 11 size squares to accommodate the pieces. He's on six minutes. Oh, no. Uh-oh. See, this is where I'd want to offer a draw, because, like, at this point, even if I beat him, what am I going to learn from this? It's not like either of us knows what this position very well. And so, like, I would be sorely off, uh, tempted to offer a draw just out of respect so he could play the other games. And if he wants to, like, play this position some other time, we could do that. All right. So, yeah, he left a hole behind. Uh, I didn't think he'd do that, because this leaves a big freaking hole on this diagonal. Now, the worst part about this, you remember you were saying he had six minutes on all of his boards, right? I'm actually going to spend some time thinking here, because maybe I have a better move than bishop 2-4. Um, and if I have a better move, I should try to play it. And this gets really complicated. Um, so the reason he plays this move... Either it's to complete the snow roof. Like, I guess that's part of the idiomatic snow roof. Or... I have no idea what this is about. Um... So yeah, moving the bishop 2-4, threatening to break the edge file, makes sense. Um, I would like to attack on this file with his bishop on it, but I don't know if I can get away with that. Um, I really didn't expect this to happen. All right, so if I were to do something stupid and threaten to open the center file, not only would I be confining my rook, but I'd be exposing my king. So that's out. Um, if I push the pawn here, I don't really achieve very much in the short term. My knight can't really jump to either of these two squares. And eventually this bishop could drop and hit my lance in the corner. So this is perilous to push this. Yeah, I think he's just completing the snow roof, but leaving some holes here as he does it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what else can you do? And the worst part is, since I'm trying to find... Like, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this. I've already looked at the center pawn push. It's no good. I'm not trying to spend all day thinking about a move. Um, uh, yeah, I don't see any alternative to this, so we're playing it. But I spent three minutes thinking about that. Which means it's going to be at least three minutes before he comes back to this game. And he's going to be in even more of a frenzy the next time around.
And again, this is why I've mentioned, like, I would prefer to just offer a draw or something under this circumstance. Um, yeah, if he ignores bishop 2-4, my big plan is to push this. And then he pushes here, right? And, like, shit goes to hell and, you know, stuff happens. Um, but no, also possible, I guess, is that I push this up. No, that doesn't do anything to preempt this pawn strike. Hmm. Hmm. Me pushing the edge doesn't really force the issue at all. Like, so we have ideas, but they're half-baked, terrible ideas. Um. So let's put this back, put this back. So he ignores it, I push, then he pushes. Like, I've just invited pain. Um, well, pawn takes, pawn takes. So then we have a couple options, I think. One I've seen Ahiruman do, believe it or not, is bishop takes after pawn takes, pawn takes, which seems nuts. Or pawn, pawn, bishop. Like, after pawn takes, he does bishop takes. Lance takes bishop, Lance takes Lance, and the opponent has a bishop, which obviously can hit my rook, and we have a Lance, which can promote on the edge and does nothing, basically. Um, that's one possibility. Um, I've seen him do that. Is that any good? I mean, if it's terrible, why does he play it? Um... But another is pawn take, or pawn 1 5, pawn 1 5, lance 1 5. And if lance takes, bishop takes, and we both have a lance, and his lance could hit my knight. And I can't really do anything about Well, no, you can't put it here. You could put it back there. Um, and I don't have anywhere good to put a lance. So, yeah, I don't understand this opening, to put it mildly. Um, I mean, me playing Shogi is largely an exercise of me tricking opponents into thinking I know anything at all. Um, because I sure as hell don't. But yeah, I don't know if I can push my edge pawn if he just... Oh my god, what is this? Uh, fuck. Uh, okay, well, this is one way to respond to things. Um... As if matters weren't already complicated. Um. Hmm. I mean, what's he going to do with the bishop? Yes, I have an obvious hole where he could attack. Um, I guess I could exchange bishops and then move my rook back to the 8th file, which would kind of force him to put a piece on 7-7. Seven, seven. I don't know what I would do with a bishop in hand, other than scare him a lot. Um... Oh wait, a bishop, if he were to drop a bishop in 8-3, that wouldn't have very many spaces to go to. I could actually threaten to tr confine, trap, whatever it. Um, that threat is an empty threat, though. <sighs> I think the bishop exchange offer is a reasonable offer. I've not found a way to refute it yet. 
Um, and the most reasonable aspect of it is that it slows down my edge attack. Um, Yeah, my edge attack is going absolutely nowhere. So I'm actually quite glad to see all these ideas in this game where it doesn't count for a tournament standing. Um, like, if I were to see this and be surprised by it in the tourney to master game, that would be a bit disappointing. Um... His upright gets a little weaker if I could just find a way in. But it's not so easy. I think I have to continue my attack on this edge, even though I don't believe in it. Pawn up, bishop exchange, rook takes, and crazy shit hits the fan. Like, um, put some other red arrows stuff down here. Red arrow there. Um, and then lance takes. We exchange twice over here, and then I drop a pawn right in front of their lance, and I will get a lance. And then using that lance, I can break on the edge file. Um, yeah, no, I lose a pawn temporarily, and I have to sack the lance, and I can put a pawn down in front of the lance, and... Like, he gets a pawn as well as a tempo, if I do it that way. I'm just terrible at attacking, so I don't know, like... That's the best I'm seeing here. If there's something better, I just don't see it. Like, I could go back. Um... I just have no idea how to pursue an attack without sacrificing material. I'm not very good at that. Uh, now, I could exchange the bishops proactively and then put it back down on the same square, um, threatening the same shtick. Might not be a bad thing to do. I mean, where else would my bishop go anyhow? But giving him a bishop in hand is really scary. Um, also, I could just be patient, move the rook back, and see what he does. Uh, I thought about bishop 3, 5. Uh, rook 2, 4. To lure the pawn to 3, 5. To 2, 5. Yeah. Um, that makes sense, too. If yeah, if we put the bishop up, uh, so yeah, bishop three five is a possibility. Um, allows the opponent to drop a bishop on eight three. Where hmm, there might be something I could do about that, but it's not easy. Um. Also, if I move my rook away, if bishop takes, pawn takes, I've opened up another square for him to drop a bishop on. 
which is not great. Um, Yeah, a rook exchange would be delightful here. So you're thinking bishop 3-5, rook 2-4 to lure the pawn up and be... Yeah, if a rook exchange does happen, that would be something to be grateful for. I honestly don't see how to force a rook exchange to occur. Um, also, if he puts the bishop back here, it might not escape. So maybe I'm afraid of nothing there. Um, no, wait. Yeah, pawn one five looks interesting and complicated and interesting. So we're going to play the interesting move here that loses a pawn. Because I've looked at alternatives and I'm not seeing squat. And our opponent is in severe time pressure. And, yeah, we could go into the trade with rook eight four. Yeah, so if I were to play rook eight four, well, yeah, I don't know. I needed to spend more time thinking. I got anxious. I don't have enough time. Six minutes is not enough time for me to figure out if rook eight four is a good move. Six hours, maybe. Six minutes, no. Um, so we're going to settle on playing this and see where it ends up. Um, also, technically possible might be if bishop takes bishop, pawn takes pawn. And then we push the pawn and somehow break through giving up an entire bishop, which seems retarded. Yeah, that's not worth doing. Never mind. Yeah. You're right, there's a 60 second increment, but I'm also factoring into account um, just how clock time works in simuls. So this is the right timing for me to make a move, to make as big a dent as possible into my opponent's clock, but also to break his attention as many times as possible. This is the right timing for me to play, even if it's not the right move. Um, yeah, it's true he has no pawns to drop, and there, I, yeah, it's tricky. But he would get a bishop, and it would not be difficult for him to obtain a pawn. So, as big a fan I am of, um, that crazy pawn takes pawn idea. I think this is the more sensible way about it. So we catch him in the middle of whatever castle transition he's doing and see whether he dares to play his bishop into this confined space. Um, I don't think he does. And if he does, I'm surprised, and I have no idea what I'm doing. But uh, we'll get there. Um, oh, also, curiously, um, yeah, if we their lance does move forward at any point, we might have a tactic with a bishop drop somewhere out here, supporting a pawn drop, and then the pawn advances and wins the knight. Or a pawn drops behind the lance and then advances and tries to win the rook, and crazy stuff happens. Um, either way, regardless, this felt like the interesting thing to look at. This, If I were on the defending side and my opponent played the duck formation strategy, this would be the thing I'd be afraid of. Um whether it works or not. Uh, let's see, yeah, we're going to stay true to the plan, even though the plan looks risky. 
Looks extremely risky. Um, it occurs to me, he could actually put a pawn in front of my lance, couldn't he? My entire strategy is based on breaking the file, which I fail to do if he puts a pawn, like, anywhere in front. <sighs> Such forward thinking on my part. Um, I mean, he's always got this possibility of putting the pawn in front, so I'm going to move the pawn around the board so I don't mess this up. Um, but yeah, there's my target. So, yeah, he's up a pawn at this point, which really means he's up... Wait, what? Yeah, he will be up two pawns um, in hand to my none in hand after this. Um, so I'm counting on my ability to find some kind of an initiative here. Yeah, he's finally starting to accelerate. And I knew he was going to do that, which is why I played quickly, um, or why I played at the timing I did. It's because I needed to take a big dent out of the clock here before uh, he accelerated. Um, so now he's in as much time pressure as I can put him in. But um, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I don't like my strategy. Now, what I keep saying is that eventually he's just going to put a pawn down on the first file. And the fact that I've sacrificed a pawn does not mean that I get to break through like I thought it did. Just because I win the lance, or since I get the lance in hand, does not mean I broke through. I'm particularly bad at figuring out these pawn exchange situations, or these edge file attack situations. I just, I don't get it, ever. Um... All right, do we sack the rook to get the lance? No. <laughs> Wouldn't that be special? Uh, we could play lance 2-5 drop. Oh, God. Yes. Uh, yeah, that would decide things, wouldn't it? Uh, okay. That would be a far, far stronger move. All right, let's get the hell out of here. Um, try to avoid lots of bishop fork tactic stuff. Actually, we have time. If I go here, is there a bishop fork? Not that I see. You could drop it here, but the, like it doesn't do anything. Drop it back here, hitting the knight and the pawn, and then later hit my rooks. So yeah, let's let's bail to the obvious post. Uh, I don't expect my rook to stay long on this square anyhow. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right that 2 three's vulnerable, as I was just pointing out. So, yeah. 2-3 um, is going to fall. He's going to break through with the rook and the pawn and the bishop on 2-3. And I am thoroughly fucked, and he's not doing it. So, praise be. All right. Um, either that or he somehow believes in my attack, which is the slowest attack of all time. But he believes in it, so we should try to believe in it too, I guess. Um, can I do anything about this attack at this phase? Actually, if he did this bishop drop, I, my gold could harass the bishop. Um, he's got other ways to break in on this first file, especially after I take the lance. This opens up a square. Well, actually it doesn't. But there's nothing I can do to stop him. So let's just continue the caveman attack on the first file. 
Uh, so one, two, and then at some point we have to put a lance on some either behind or in front of the pawn. I'm guessing behind. Oh, I, I can't draw an arrow, but just imagine an arrow with the lance supporting this pawn. So three moves for me to form an attack that he can refute in a single pawn drop. And this is all I've achieved is, well, I should have lost a pawn and I did not lose a pawn and we are somewhere now that we were not earlier. Um, material balance is restored. He has a pawn in hand, at least for now. Um, I can't trick him into making things easy for me. I could put my rook behind the pawn because there's nothing he can use to hit my rook. He could sacrifice the lance for the pawn. Uh, he could use a bishop to attack the pawn, I guess. So I could stick either a rook or a lance behind... Oh! Oh, hang on. I have one threat. I have two threats. Hmm... Interesting. Hmm. How long have I had these both of these threats? Okay, so I wanted the lance, and now that I have a lance in hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. If you put the lance somewhere like that, um, potentially I could maybe have the bishop drop in the corner, and that sometimes works out, but here, like, since they have this pawn on 3-3, or 3-7, um, that doesn't quite work out the way we'd want it to. So if I put the lance back down, they put a pawn back down on the first file, we're back where we started, no? Um, which might not be a terrible thing, especially since 2-3 is vulnerable. Um, not ex okay, well, so I'm thinking my best chance lies on striking on the eighth file. I don't know that I want to give up this pawn just to start an attack on the eighth file. Because his attack, counterattack on the first and second files comes through quite swiftly. Um, I think I need to play Lance 1-1, one, one, as stupid as it looks. Um, okay, no, that's a fair point. Uh, my pawn is further advanced on the first file than it used to be. That is a meaningful difference. So the tricky question here is if he puts a pawn on 1-3 instead of, like, elsewhere on the first file. Uh, it's a two-part question. One, do I take it? And two, if so, how? Um, I'm thinking the answer is if pawn 1-3, maybe rook 1-4, the patient move, might be the way to do it. Um, like, it looks crazy, but... He doesn't really have a good way to prevent me from taking the pawn on 1-3 with my rook. If I were to do lance takes 1-3, he could do bishop drop back on 1-2. Oh, I could surround it again. Never mind. See, it's lance takes. Um, yeah, the gold can defend. I'm getting... I'm very, very slowly getting used to playing with this set. Um, yeah, so he has to play something like this. Uh, and now, eventually, when I get the pawn in hand, that eventual pawn can go on 1-8. Um, or 2-7 or something. Um, hmm. So I have a choice between trying to break on the 8th file, 
or trying to force a rook exchange somehow. Um, this is not easy. Um, like, it really looks like bishop 1-3, trying to play pawn 2-4 again, and 2-4 doesn't go anywhere. But if I could force a rook exchange, that'd be great. I can't. Um, if I could break through on the 8th file with my rook, that'd be great. I almost can. I can get a pawn in hand. And then eventually he gets the pawn pushed to 2-4. I take rook takes. I don't have a follow-up. Uh, it's tragic. Um, uh, Oh, I wonder, maybe there's something with pawn 1-6, pawn takes, lance takes 1-6, lance takes, bishop 4-9, uh, and then they promote their lance, and my bishop promotes on the first file. No, that, if I'm giving up a lance, they can use a lance to protect the lance. That's no good. Um, bishop sacks are ridiculous. Um... I just don't... So we've we've got this pawn on 2-5 now. And I don't see how to force a rook exchange. Yes, no, you're right. I don't see how to force a rook exchange. So yeah, maybe trying to exchange pawns on the eighth file. Um, opening possibilities of tactics. Having a pawn in hand later could be useful. If I do pawn eight six, they do bishop drop, forking my rook and pawn. I'd sack the rook just to take the pawn and take the gold. Um, they take my rook. This is not great. So... Pushing the pawns a bit anxious or eager. Where the fuck is my bishop gonna go? Um, yeah, yeah, I kind of like it too. Only because I really want to force a rook exchange, and I don't see any other way to do it. Um. If I put my bishop on 1-3, they place or push pawn 1-6, I take lance takes pawn 1-4, and then I can place or push pawn 2-4. Um, actually, that's quite good. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, pawn, bishop drop at 3-5. Allowing them to push the pawn to 3-6 gives them somewhere to put their bishop. So the bishop really belongs on 1-3 to begin with, and then later we can move it forward, but no. That doesn't make sense either. I don't know. Hmm... I'm not seeing a constructive move. This is not good.
I could push the edge file pawn. 0.86, no. Yeah. I think I'm just at a loss for finding a move here. And I think this is the most reasonable move I can come up with in this circumstance. Um, it's not a bad move. Yeah, he pushes his own rook pawn. I've not really lost or gained anything here. Um, but we could pursue the same idea on this edge that we pursued on the left edge, but actually they don't have a rook to oppose us over here. So I push, pawn takes, lance takes, lance takes, pawn drop, and it's their move. Um, so that's possible. Again, sacking a pawn just to try to break in. I'll try as uh, an understatement. We actually successfully break in there. Um, Oh. Um, I really don't like the idea of blocking my rook in any way. Uh, what do I do? Um, Time warning. Yeah, I'm just totally blind here, so we're going to play the one thing I see. Um, which is me sacrificing a pawn to try to break in. Oh, bishop takes one seven. I did not even seriously consider this. It did merit serious consideration because of the rook one four move at the end. Um, yeah, that did merit serious consideration. I couldn't figure it out, but you're right. Um, I just kept circling back to this thing, which doesn't go anywhere. Um, so... We'll see how this goes, or doesn't. Yeah, it's interesting. It definitely merited consideration. I, you just saw I was in severe time pressure by the end, but that's not. That's not discrediting your idea. It's just explaining how I didn't end up playing it. Um, Alright, we started this idea, so let's bring it to fruition.
And here it's not even so much about preventing the lance from promoting, although that is huge. Um, also important here uh, is that I could actually use the lance. I'm not sure where, but someday it will prove useful. So let's get it before we try to like promote my bishop in the corner somehow. And even if my bishop does promote in the corner safely, which it doesn't seem to... Um, oh, I'm sorry, the point I was trying to make is that I want the file for my rook. And my opponent does have to do something to like oppose this file. Um, that was my point. Not that I need the lance. Yeah, and I was figuring they'll do lance 9-9, nine, nine, pawn takes, lance takes, and maybe I do lance here and we do a uh, repetition draw. Just, I am out of ideas. They didn't do the expected move. This greatly surprises me because this rook promotion threat seems very large. And I don't see how they stop it anymore. Um, now, perhaps they're arguing that like their threats against my king are equally large. Um, I don't believe that. But perhaps that's the argument. Yes, right. My king has four generals and two escape hatches. So my king is going to be fine. Um, this position might remind us of what happened this morning when I was on the receiving end of something very similar. Um, so, yeah. All right, so they have a lance, a, two pawns, and a bishop. Um, now, the target here should be if I promote the rook, I want to strike across the rank directly at the king. The back rank is tempting, too, but they have all the back rank squares covered. Um... So the next target becomes the gold general standing right next to the king. Um, so my rook could promote, and I'm like, I'm being irrational here because I don't want to cede this pawn and give the king an escape route. Um. Because this gold is defended, I'm not going to win the gold for nothing. Um, so I'm tempted to just stick a piece in front of my rook and promote that instead of promoting the rook. But a promoted rook is a very powerful piece. Um, I'm just confused because, like, Yes, I get some amazing attacks, but I don't see uh, what's so forcing about my... Okay, yeah, this pawn in particular is a target. So my rook moves up, I drop the lance, I promote the lance, it takes the pawn, it takes the gold. Okay, there's a plan. It might not work, but it is a plan. It probably works, but in case it doesn't... Um, we're still okay. Let's promote. So yeah, our next idea is uh, drop the lance and promote it, and then take here. Or if they take the pawn, chase down the knight and promote the knight here or something. Um. 
So what is concerning is that one, I've opened this, two, this might happen, but I'm doing nothing to accelerate it. In fact, if this does happen, I just take it. Because rook takes, uh, we have a pin or a fork, depending how we want to do it. So yeah, this actually isn't a threat. Um, but they could drop a bishop here. They could drop a lance here. If they do drop a lance here, my knight can move away and stuff. Well, if they do drop a lance and take the knight, Gold takes is actually fine, even though it slightly separates my generals for a turn. There's no immediate way to exploit that. So yeah, this attack down the right edge file looks very strong. Um, also, I'm trying to resolve, like, if I do a bishop drop over here and then sack and then, like, could I even use my gold to attack the silver? Silver just runs away. No. So it's not the easiest target to snipe at. Okay, the king is running. The king is on a special adventure. Um, hmm. Didn't see that. Probably I would see that if I were on the other, on the defending side of this position. Um, Man, it's so tempting just to defend the pawn, defend this bishop drop square. Um, and try to hold everything together in one compact, safe-ish formation. Um, then he moves the gold over, and then I have difficulty promoting other stuff, but I could still do it. Like, taking a time out to defend stuff is the paranoid thing to do here, but it looks right. Um, unless I can find some way to exchange one piece for two on this gold, which I can't. Um... Yeah. Oh, he's still got a lance, too. Um, yeah, there is actually another way I could defend against stuff. Well, it takes forever for this to break in, but um, it's possible. Yuck. No, we're going to put this, we're going to do the principled thing and just promote and then take this pawn. Yeah. Yeah, we would create a token if we had a pawn. We don't. Uh, bishop 4, no, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that's got to be on our radar. Um, let's get her done. So we're going to get ourselves a pawn here. 
<sighs> and maybe somehow force our way into this castle? I don't know. Yeah, I suspect you're right. This is still like tremendously upsetting to me as I try to attack, but you're probably right that like everything's fine and there's no need for me to panic. Also of some interest is hypothetically if like the king moves over, uh, if the king moves here and if I bishop drop, uh, if they try to trap me, there's this pin across the second rank. So, yeah, there's that. Um, okay, we're just going to march toward the king. Maybe I should have taken this pawn again. Like, I'm giving him a token. I don't know how to evaluate any of this. Um, I'm doing the best I can, but it's tremendously frustrating not knowing. Not having any notion of a clue as to what, like, the priority should be here. I think you would have taken here and then dropped bishop 1-3. I idly considered that a little bit. Um, obviously now I've chosen my path, but hang on. Hang on. Okay, so what can you drop? He can drop with some stuff. I'm not mating him back here. Uh, I could pawn a bishop drop back here. Gold moves. I don't have any special tactics. Let's see, let's just take the gold here. Threatening to take the knight and to continue munching stuff as we walk toward the king. Yeah, so I've given my lance, I've let him into my camp, and I'm contending that somehow it's going to be okay. Um, got one bishop, one gold. And they have one bishop in hand as well. Bishop drop. They have to like move their rook out before I do something crazy. Because I'm threatening a gold drop to follow. If bishop drop, they move the gold back. I hit the rook. Yeah, bishop 4-9 still looks interesting. Um... The value of the pieces doesn't matter as much anymore as breaking into the castle. So maybe I should refocus. Um, pawn drop here. They, Yeah, actually, if I let them advance any further down this file, things get scary. So if I bishop drop, they just push the pawn. I gold drop, and they take my gold, and stuff gets crazy. So I, I would prefer if I had time to go back in time to not have this happen um too late now um yeah bishop 49 still looks interesting because like it prevents the rook promotion and i could use a rook to help break this king open but other pieces are more useful than a rook right now um Bishop 4 and I also looks interesting because if the gold moves back, I can maybe sack it for the silver and keep harassing. Um, all right, holding down this cursor so I don't. Yeah, let's let's see if this works or not. I'm curious. It may or may not work, um, but it looks interesting. And if they do hit my gold, maybe it moves away and I let them promote the dragon and I just haul off and start attacking somehow here. I don't know. Um, but my initial guess was that the rook moves without promotion and we have a fight on our hands.
but also I could promote my bishop right next to the king. Although I don't have a way to follow it up, which is annoying. Or I could stack for this gold, and I guess king takes, I'm not sure. Yeah, dragon takes is also a threat here. So yeah, dragon takes and then bishop, or after I take here, they are going to move this, but then that's maiden one. Okay, never mind. Goodness. Yeah, I should stop reading our chat window right about now, because um, as much help as I've gotten throughout the game to try to make this an interesting game, um, I should probably try to figure the rest out on my own here. I know I'm doing this for an audience, and so part of the fun here is actually the collaborative aspect. This is a more exhibition sort of game. This is not a real... Uh, I mean, we knew it wasn't a fair competition in the first place because he's playing so many opponents at once, but also this is strictly an exhibition. If I win, that doesn't mean anything about our respective skills. If it lose, it means I suck, but we already knew that. Uh, yeah. I apologize if it sounds like I'm censoring, but, like, obviously, for a game that's running on so long where there's nothing at stake, um, other than pride. Um, that's a different situation than if it's some big tournament game. All right, so knight one three threatens, uh, well, okay, I could just, there's a lot of stuff I could do here. Taking the knight looks compelling. Surrounding the king on the other side looks compelling, although they can drop stuff to scare my bishop and it's not so easy. Actually, that's lost. Um, moving the knight up, trying to trap the rook, uh, leads to Tokin takes knight. And who knows where we end up next. So that's why taking this knight here looks like the most compelling option. That said, it's painful because they can drop something to scare my rook away. And there's not a whole lot I can do. Um, or it's a dragon, but same idea. Um, a token doesn't really help me a lot here. Wait, if they scare my bishop, it just, yeah, they don't have the right piece to trap my promoted bishop here. <sighs> don't know. I mean, having the knight is better than not having the knight. Having a direct path toward my opponent's king is better than not having a direct path. And if they do, like, put the lance here to scare my dragon, maybe I sacrifice bishop takes gold and then drop the gold here, and then I can take the silver as well. So that's what I'm thinking. This has the downside that his king is escaping, and I'm agitated by that, but um, I can get over it. Okay. Um, this is completely ignoring my attack on his king. A bold, bold strategy. But it had to be done. It had to be tried. Um,
Well, it's not what I envisioned myself playing here until about two seconds before I played it. Um, it looks okay. It really just underscores how powerful the Tolkien was in the first place. Um, that I had to do something about it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that I'm sure that helps, right? Um, so, as long as I'm careful not to get mated in... But yeah, no, my gold needs to go back. Or I need to put down another gold or something. Um, I really don't want to get mated here. Uh, if I could just read these positions, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Instead of having to guess the whole time. But no, this belongs back here in almost every circumstance. Maybe not this one, but almost every circumstance. I need this rank blocked. Um, if he takes this, I could put a pawn somewhere. There's a great many places I could stick a pawn. Um, but no, also I need to start harassing the king here. I am stunned that um, he's not reinforced his king's position. I don't understand. All right, here goes nothing. This was my plan. So next up is bishop takes gold, um, followed by a myriad of captures. So if my king ever comes under attack, it will run. Um, but as for now, their king's under attack. Oh, also possible as gold takes silver. And if king takes, uh, I take and I don't know. No, bishop takes gold is the right move. Followed by surrounding the king on all sides. Um, unfortunate. well, okay, he is not defending his king. A lance drop might have saved him, but probably not. Um, all right, bishop takes, king takes... Um, gold drop, king up, gold here, king takes. How did I misread that? I thought my gold was defended here. Apparently not. Okay. Um, that's disturbing. All right, night drop. Maybe makes all this work. Knight drop threatens. Bishop takes gold. King takes. Gold drop. King can't go here anymore. Has to go back into the line of fire and then I have mate. Uh, do I have any other move order that works here? Takes. King takes. Um... I got nothing. Unfortunately, it's got to be this. That's disgusting because it's not check. This gives him an opportunity to defend, and I don't like that. But what's he going to defend with? Like, he's done a million sume. I've done, like, five. He's reading this ten moves ahead, and I'm not. 
Although, yeah, he is uh, down to three games. Uh, so, yeah, he's going to find this, and I have no idea what I'm going to do next. He's not finding it. All right, he's focused on time management, and that spells the game. Unless I've missed something critical. But how in the world, ten moves in a row, could I have missed something so critical? Bishop takes, king takes, gold drop. Um, King up, rook, or dragon takes, mate. There's really no variations here. So that's game. All right, good game. Well played.